Thank you so much for the, the nice introduction, Jim, and uh, a huge thank you to the, the organizers of the colloquium series uh, for keeping it going through COVID. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to share with you today uh, some of the EHT work that we've been doing here um, to, to take the first images of a black hole, um, but also to understand those images more deeply, to understand the, the theoretical predictions for black hole images, and to really be designing new instruments uh, that are going to be specifically tailored uh, to understanding more about black holes using uh, imaging. Now, before I get into the specifics of this talk, I, I just want to give a huge shout out to all the, the collaborators here at the CFA. Um, so hopefully there are a lot of familiar faces here. It turns out the, the EHT and, and next generation EHT uh, or NGHT groups have almost uh, 40 people. They span all career phases um, and everything from uh, uh, engineering uh, and instrument design for the EHD, to running the observations, to doing data analysis and calibration, uh, to doing uh, first principle simulations to understand the, the EHD science. So uh, uh, a huge amount of effort here, and, um, and of course, all the work that I'm going to be uh, showing you uh, wouldn't be possible with, without such a strong local group. Um, so this story really begins uh, with the, the galaxy uh, so this is a mainstay in astronomy, of, co of course. Um, and the, the key thing about it is that it's, it's about 55 million light years away. Uh, so this means that even with the best optical telescopes we have, such as the, the Hubble Space Telescope, um, all we can really resolve is this, this, uh, this ball of stars with a faint jet extending away from it. Um, now we can peer deeper into the source using the technique of radio interferometry. Um, and this gives us higher angular resolution. And as we look at higher and higher frequencies, the jet becomes more and more optically thin. Uh, so starting at a few gigahertz and then pushing all the way to 230 gigahertz here at the end, uh, we have the, the first image ever taken of a black hole. Uh, and this was what was released by the Event Horizon Telescope in 2019. Um, now there are two extraordinary scales to grapple with in this image. Uh, the first is just how big this black hole is about six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. And that's estimated just by the, the diameter of this, uh, of this orange donut. Um, that's because the black hole is sitting in the middle, uh, blocking and trapping light and, and casting the shadow on that bright surrounding emission. Um, the second extraordinary scale is just how small this is on the sky. Uh, so it turns out the diameter of this, this donut is about 40 micro arc seconds. Um, so that's about the same angular size as a donut sitting on the moon or an, an atom called an arm's length. Uh, so it really de required developing this technique of very long baseline interferometry in order to, get to, to access these incredibly small angular scales. Um, and the most recent thing that we've added to this is that um, uh, just this year, we published the first polarization images of a black hole. So we added the linear polarization structure sitting on top of this. So it's this, this sort of moderately polarized structure that traces out this, uh, this spiral pattern in the image um, and gives us the, the first view into what the magnetic field structure near a black hole might look like. So to produce these, uh, we use the Event Horizon Telescope, which is this collection of telescopes all over the globe. Um, and these were all previously existing facilities. And, and what the EHT effort was, was to um, add the instrumentation needed so that these sites could work together so typically that involved installing atomic clocks at every site so they could be perfectly synchronized. And then also installing high-speed recording equipment so that the and incident- my, 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 your, my, your audio keeps fading in and out. Is, is there a problem that the, you can solve with that? Uh, I, it may be my headset. I could try disconnecting it. Um, is, this, is this still audible or? Uh, I don't hear anything now, sorry. It's, it's completely audible to us. Give me just one second. Uh, we'll let you know. Okay, do you hear me now? Yes. Um, okay, uh, please let me know if it keeps fading and I'll, I'll keep on that. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for alerting me. I also probably won't see the chat, so maybe Jim, just uh, just let me know if there's something I need to respond to. Um, right, so the Event Horizon Telescope, um, uh, it's this collection of telescopes all over the world, and what's exciting is it's not a first light instrument. We're still pushing it uh, to be 
significantly better. So in 2017, we recorded um, uh, our observation using eight stations at six different geographic locations. Um, and every, every image you've ever seen from the EHT was produced using this observing campaign. Uh, and every station in that campaign recorded data at 32 gigabits per second. Uh, so that determines the sensitivity of our observations. In 2018, we added the Greenland telescope, uh, and we also doubled the data rates and, and moved to dual sideband recording. And in 2020, we actually um, we had a really exciting campaign plan. We were adding another site in Arizona at Kitt Peak, and also adding a, uh, the Noema array in France. Uh, that was unfortunately canceled because of COVID, but we were able to uh, do those observations in 2021. Uh, so we had a, a, a successful campaign earlier this year. Um, and all of these campaigns have been full polarization observations. Now, the way that an interferometer works is that every pair of, of baselines, uh, form, or every pair of telescopes forms a baseline that samples just one spatial frequency of the source image. Uh, so it's sort of akin to if, if the image were a song, each baseline just hears one note. Uh, and in order to reconstruct an image or, or hear the whole song, what you need is many different baselines and lots of different orientations and lengths. And then you can combine that information together to, to form this image. Uh, so I just want to give you some intuition about, uh, about the, the information needed in the EHT to make this image. Uh, so we, if we scale it back and, and use just a single baseline, then it turns out that the EHT would only be able to reconstruct a featureless blob on the sky. Uh, a single baseline might provide very high resolution, but it doesn't provide any uh, distinguishing spatial information. Now, if we add another telescope, then we have three sites and three baselines, and that's enough to sort of split the image into two pieces, but not reveal much about its morphology. If we add our sites in Hawaii, then it splits apart, sort of looks like the opening of a jet. And then we add finally the, our last site uh, in Spain, and that, that's enough to, uh, to produce this ring on this. Uh, but the point that, that I, I want you to understand is just that we're, we're just scraping you know, the very surface of what's possible with with, uh, with black hole imaging. We have barely enough information with the EHT to even make an image at all. And so the future is really bright for making much sharper images with higher dynamic range. And, and the question is, what could we learn from those? So in terms of current EHT interpretation, the, the main tool that we have these days uh, uh, to try to make sense of what we're seeing is uh, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations. So here's an example of one of them. This is from the Illinois group, and this is something that a lot of people here at the CFA uh, work on as well. Um, so the question is, how, uh, how can we connect the EHT image to these numerical simulations, and what is it telling us about the black hole and about its surrounding accretion flow? So here's just one example of a snapshot from a, uh, a GRMHD simulation. Um, and it turns out that this simulation is, is perfectly consistent with the EHT images once you convolve it to the, the EHT resolution. Uh, so this is a so-called MAD image. MAD stands for Magnetically Arrested Disk. Uh, so it's a simulation that it has dynamically important magnetic fields. Uh, the black hole is rapidly spinning. So it, it has a dimensionless spin of 0.94, close to a theoretical limit. And it has um, a phenomenological electron heating prescription that's determined by this R high parameter, uh, which is set to 10. Um, now, the, what's interesting though, is that uh, there are lots of other simulations that are also consistent with EHT images. Uh, so here's an example of a so-called SANE model. So this one has weak magnetic fields, they're turbulent and irregular. Uh, the black hole is not spinning at all, and it has the same electron heating prescription. And then our third one is a, a black hole that, that also has weak magnetic fields. And in this case, it's, it's rapidly spinning, but it's actually a retrograde accretion flow. So the black hole is spinning one direction and the accretion flow is spinning the other. Um, and all three of these are consistent with EHT images. So these simulations are doing a remarkably good job at predicting what the morphology of EHT images should look like. Uh, but the disadvantage is that it's very difficult to derive physical constraints from the from black uh, so examples of poorly constrained quantities are things like the black hole spin. We have no constraints on spin um, other than the, the, the direction of the spin on, onto the sky. Um, we don't know even where the, the, uh, the, the emitting material is. It can be in the disk of the black hole or it could be in the forward or the counter jet. 
Um, we don't know whether the magnetic fields are necessarily strong or weak just from these images. And the, even the accretion rate is very poorly constrained using the, only the total intensity images. So the, the guiding question that I wanted to think about uh, here in this presentation is just what mean relativistic signatures in a black hole image uh, could we target with, a, with an improved image? Um, or are we always going to be sort of drowning in degeneracy? Like are black hole images really the right way to be studying them? Um, or are, are they masked by too much obscurity? But the first image I wanted to discuss uh, is, is sort of how this all began. It's the, the black hole shadow. Um, and on the left is an image of rays that are passing near a black hole before escaping to an observer that's located on the right. Um, so the rays on the left are colored by where they're picking up light. Uh, and in this particular model, it's a spherical accretion flow where, where matter is falling onto the black hole. And on the right is the image that a distant observer would see. Now, what's really interesting here is that because the material is falling, on, falling onto a black hole, any part of the ray that's, that's also falling towards the black hole uh, sees light that is heavily Doppler boosted, whereas rays that are climbing out of the black hole have uh, a emission that's Doppler deboosted. And so what happens is that you, you uh, produce a very dark region in the, in the center of the image corresponding to the black hole shadow. And this is precisely those rays that when traced backward terminate on the black hole. Uh, and this, is, uh, this was just computed in Schwarzschild uh, and it was first computed by David Hilbert in 1916. So uh, uh, Bardeen in the 1970s extended this calculation to the case of a uh, spinning black hole. And what he showed was that if the black hole is, is rotating, uh, it changes the shape of the shadow. So a short shield black hole has a perfectly circular shadow. But if we allow the black hole to spin, uh, then what happens is that at higher and higher spin, the shadow becomes displaced. It slides over uh, to one side. And then it also becomes compressed. So especially at the highest spins, you'll see that on the left, left hand side of the, the shadow there, the, the black hole flattens, um, and it's also squeezed in the horizontal direction. Uh, so uh, Bardeen also, he noted, it's conceptually interesting, if not astrophysically very important to calculate the precise shape of the black hole. Unfortunately, there seems to be no hope of observing this. Um, and it's sort of a, a wonderful theme in the story that there's a lot of theoretical work that's just done curiosity uh, that, that's really guiding the interpretation of the, the astrophysics that we're doing these days. Now, uh, now, we can summarize the, 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 the change in the size and shape of the shadow by, by just looking at uh, two things. One is the, the overall uh, diameter of the shadow, and the second is its asymmetry. Um, and what it turns out is that the diameter changes are, are largest if you're looking face on at a black hole. So the biggest black hole you'll ever see is for a Schwarzschild black hole, a non spin black hole. And then as you spin it up, the shadow sh uh, shrinks. And the most asymmetric shadows are those when you're looking at a, a black hole edge on. Um, and because in, in a black hole such as M87, we think that we're looking very close to a uh, face on, we, we expect that the asymmetry of the shadow is less than 2%. Meaning that if we want to study the spin of M87 by the shape of its shadow, it's a very small effect and it'll be an extremely difficult measurement. So one thing we wondered was, Maybe there's some other way you could use the full curve of the, the boundary of a black hole shadow in order to learn about the black hole properties. You know, instead of distilling it just down to uh, an average uh, diameter and, and uh, average asymmetry, maybe if you fit the full shape, that contains more information. Uh, so this is a project that was uh, done by an undergraduate uh, researcher at the CFA, Joseph Farah. Um, and Joseph actually found some really interesting things. He, he found that the maximally spinning black hole uh, viewed edge on takes a very simple functional form. It's a parametric form uh, of a curve known as a uh, lameson. Now this also is a family of curves that include things like the cardioid. Uh, and Joseph showed that if you take a lameson and you just displace it from the origin and you take its convex hull, then that precisely describes the, the maximally spinning black hole viewed edge on. This is the only black hole that, uh, this is the only solution ever derived uh, for a simple parametric form for a black hole shadow, except the case of one viewed face on where it's just a circle. Um, 
But this had uh, another consequence. And, and, and Joseph realized that even though the Le Maison doesn't perfectly describe black hole shadows at all inclinations, it provides an exquisite approximation, but something like a part in 10 to the four. So down on the bottom, you'll see these two examples of, of other spinning black holes uh, viewed edge on, where the, the Le Maison, uh, for a particular choice of these two parameters, lambda one and lambda two, uh, is an excellent approximation for the black hole shadow. Now, the interesting thing here is that black hole sh uh, shadows have three parameters. There's the spin, the viewing inclination, um, uh, and, and the mass. Uh, whereas the Lemaison is only described by two parameters. And so that means that there's a fundamental degeneracy in studying black holes by the size and shape of their shadows. You can never understand everything there is the, about the black hole. Uh, it's a very weak uh, insight into the black hole structure. So fortunately for Sag A star, our galactic center black hole, we know the mass. And for M87, we know the inclination. So for these two sources, it still might be possible with future observations to extract information about the spin just from the size and shape of the shadow. But for a general black hole, this is really not a very effective way of studying them. So a different direction that we could go, another way, is that we know that black holes are variable. Maybe we can use variability of black holes as a way to, to understand properties of their space-time. Uh, so we already saw that for GRMHD simulations, they show intense variability. And also for M7, uh, observations at longer wavelengths show that the, the jet is highly dynamic. This is stringing together about seven months of observations at seven millimeters. Um, and you can see that the, the jet is writhing and injecting material continuously near the black hole. So the EM EHT image is on there for scale. And the real question is, how does the black hole anchor and drive this variability? And most importantly, what is powering the jet in M87? So one possibility is that it's powered through the liber liberation of gravitational energy. But the much more exciting possibility is that it's actually powered by extracting spin energy from the black hole. Um, in, a, in a Penrose type, type process, where magnetic fields that are threading the event horizon are dragged by the rotating black hole and use that to, to power energy extraction uh, into the jet. So to tackle this uh, and to really study the dynamical, uh, dynamical systems of black holes in their jet, we're designing the next generation event horizon telescope. Uh, so this is going to be a, a significantly enhanced EHT ground array It'll have up to 10 new telescopes. Um, and these have two significant differences from the current EHT telescopes. So one is that they're, they're much smaller apertures. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the sensitivity of an inner parametric baseline goes as the geometric mean of the sensitivity of the two uh, telescopes at either end. So we can use the current EHT sites as sensitive anchors to allow much smaller uh, telescopes to join the array and to make much uh, uh, significantly improved images. And the second difference is that these are telescopes that are going to, instead of being uh, facilities that exist in their own right and just join an EHT campaign for a few nights a year, these are going to be used all the time for NGEHT research. So we can track these sources over many months, over thousands of gravitational timescales and understand how the black holes uh, connect to their jets. So, um, to, to study the jet in M87, the, the NGHT will increase the field of view of current EHT images by a factor of 10 or more. And it'll increase the dynamic range by a factor of more than 1,000. Uh, so this will give us a, you know, an exquisite look into, uh, into the dynamics of, of the jet and, all, and the way they connect all the way back down to the black hole. Um, so I also just wanted to put this in context a little bit, especially with the, the recent release of the decadal survey. So here's an example. This is just a summary of a lot of uh, upcoming facilities that are going to be coming online over the next uh, one to two decades. Uh, in the space of angular resolution shown on the vertical axis and observing frequency shown on the horizontal axis. So on the left, we have these upcoming radio facilities, SKA-1, uh, NGVLA, and ALMA. On the right, we have the near-infrared and optical facilities, JWST, of course, uh, the ELTs, including uh, GMT, and uh, also the near-infrared interferometry, like uh, the gravity instrument, the VLTI. And what's common to all of these facilities is that they lack the angular resolution needed to study black holes directly by imaging. So for context, uh, this, this horizontal line is showing the, the, uh, the 
the size of the black hole shadow in M87. So if you look over the entire universe at every black hole, uh, the, the largest black holes as seen from Earth are in M87 and at the center of the Milky Way. And they both subtend about 40 to 50 micro arcs. And the EHT made great strides by looking at just a tiny sliver of this parameter space. Uh, so it, it, it was operating at basically a single frequency, but marching down to these extremely uh, fine angular resolutions that were enough to see the black hole shadow. The NGHT is going to expand that in two directions, expanding the field of view by an order of magnitude, pushing to uh, finer angular resolution at higher frequencies and also overlapping with NGBLA to really uh, cover a, a sort of facility level range of parameter space diagram like this. Just to give you a, a sense of what the NGHT might be able to do, uh, on the left now is, is a simulated uh, image of, of M87. This is a simulation done by, by Andrew Shale. And on the right is a sample image reconstruction with the NGHT that was performed by Blackburn. Um, and so you can see that the, the NGHT really has enough dynamic range to, to connect the black hole out to scales of, of hundreds of gravitational radii. Um, and, and to see the, the small scale power in the jet. And what's so exciting about this is that we don't require the, the major anchors in the EHD, such as ALMA, in order to get these high resolution, high fidelity images. So we can actually string together a series of observations over a few years, and we can study the dynamics of this entire system with the NGEHD. And again, so these are NGEHD sample image reconstructions uh, using uh, just the new NGEHD sites, but not, not ALMA. So these are uh, really exciting prospects for continued study. So that's kind of the, the astrophysics side of the problem. Um, the other question is, what will the NGHT tell us about relativistic physics? Are there other features in black hole images that we could lock onto if we had significantly uh, improved image dynamic range? And for that, uh, we can go back to this picture of the shadow of a black hole. So we saw, you know, the black hole shadow is a very prominent feature in cases where you have spherical accretion, um, and especially if there's, there's infalling material where you get these Doppler uh, existing factors. Um, now, suppose instead that you have a mission that's confined to a thin equatorial disk. Uh, so that's denoted by this, this green uh, line in the figure on the left. Uh, so in that case, there will be a second feature that emerges um, and this is something we call the inner shadow. So the black hole shadow was defined by all the rays that reach us, where if you trace them back, they terminate on the black hole. The inner shadow is defined by all the photons that reach us, where if you trace them back, they terminate on the black hole before crossing the equatorial plane. So they never have a chance to, to go through that equatorial emitting region and pick up a lot of emission. So because of this, the, the inner shadow is always strictly smaller than the shadow, and it, um, it always lives within the shadow. Uh, it's just a tighter condition, and, and it's really motivated by this, this cartoon of a thin uh, equatorial emitting region. Now, this might seem sort of irrelevant and, and hyper-simplified, but what's, what's rather fascinating is that current EHT constraints on um, using these GRMHD simulations favor these magnetically arrested disk models. And this is especially true when we include polarization constraints. In magnetically arrested disk models, the ones with dynamically important magnetic fields tend to have a mission that's arising uh, predominantly near the midplane. So on the left here, uh, that's a simulation of M87, again done by Andrew Shale. And on the right is simulations uh, from the, the original EHT papers. The top two are these magnetically arrested disks. The bottom two are, are the ones with weak magnetic fields, these SANE simulations, uh, which often have a mission arising um, at this, at this uh, jet boundary layer. Um, so with the polarization constraints, we think it's these, these MAD models are the preferred ones. Um, and so they're, they're ones where actually this, uh, this simplified toy model of an equatorial disk seems to be fairly appropriate. Um, so on the left here is a simulated image uh, of uh, of one of these simulations of M87. And uh, on the top is shown in just a linear color scale and the, on the bottom is in a, a gamma color scale, just emphasizing some of the fainter regions of the image. And you can see that indeed, this inner shadow feature, the expected one shown with the white disk here, 
um, uh, shows up prominently in these images. Now, this is something that you don't necessarily need extremely fine angular resolution to see, but what you do need is dynamic range, and that's exactly what the NGHD is going to provide. So shown on the right now is just as a sample uh, of that simulated image after it's involved with the NGEHT resolution. And on the right is a sample reconstruction using the NGEHT. And, and you can see that with these, uh, these new sites that we're expecting to add and the sensitivity that we're targeting, we should be able to see this new relativistic feature. Now, the, the wonderful thing about this is that it would break a lot of the degeneracies that we see when we're setting the shadow in isolation. So as the simplest example of this, on the left is just shown four images of a Schwarzschild black hole. So for a Schwarzschild black hole, remember the shadow, it's always a circle and it doesn't care what inclination you're looking at. So in, in, the, in the top, we're looking at the Schwarzschild black hole uh, face on, and then it's increasing the, the inclination until it's edge on at the bottom. And in every case, the, uh, the blue circle is showing the, the, the shadow, which is constant. Uh, in contrast, the inner shadow, because it depends on the, the equatorial plane, uh, is very sensitive to that viewing inclination. So in particular, if we can measure both the shadow and the inner shadow in a black hole image, then you can use their relative properties to put really tight constraints on the black hole properties. Uh, so uh, uh, on the lower right, it's just showing if you could measure, for instance, the relative displacement of the shadow centroid and the inner shadow centroid, that tells you both the, uh, the inclination and the spin uniquely. So this is a pathway to, to, to making, um, making some inferences about, about the black hole using image features that would show up uh, with the kind of resolution that we can do using ground-based VLBI. Now, another question is, is there any way that we could instead move towards really precision measurements of general relativity using black hole imaging or, or a very long baseline interferometry. The, both the shadow and the inner shadow are somewhat fuzzy image features. Uh, we can make inferences about the black hole properties, but, but it's, um, it's not something where you'd be able to say measure the, the mass or spin to many, many decimal places. Uh, so is there any, any pathway to doing that? Um, or are we always going to be stuck with these physical, with these uh, fuzzy inferences? Um, and to understand that, we can, we can take some inspiration from Charles Darwin. Uh, not Charles Darwin, the naturalist, but actually his grandson, who was a physicist. Uh, so Darwin was, was considering the problem of, suppose that you have a star located near a black hole, um, how would its image appear to a distant observer? So he knew that uh, there'd be a direct image of the star, and that would just be weakly lensed, maybe, by the, uh, by the, by the presence of the black hole. We also realized that each star, in addition to its direct image, will show a series of faint ghosts on both sides of the black hole. And he wrote, there will be a ghost on its left, just outside 3 root 3m. For the, furthermore, there will be secondary ghosts on both sides, still closer to 3 root 3m, which come from rays that have gone a complete circle around the black hole before escaping the telescope. The successive ghosts of a sequence crowd together more and more closely to such an extent as exactly to counterbalance their increasing feebleness. So the fact that, that black holes can, can pull light into orbits allows them to produce multiple images uh, of a single source. And then he added, this result seems to have no practical importance at all. And uh, he's right about everything except that last statement. And it turns out that this is, uh, uh, this is profoundly important for, for planning future observations. So going back to the EHT image, uh, we think that if we could see this image with perfect resolution, uh, that we would see something that looks more akin to this, which is, a, again, a simulated image of a black hole, which shows a bright photon ring. Um, now, this photon ring is actually composed of a stack of increasingly sharp subrings. Um, and these subrings are produced from light that's traveled around the black hole increasing number of, of times, just like in the Darwin uh, picture. Because of that, the subrings have self-similarity that's determined solely by the properties of the black hole space time. Uh, so this is a project that I did uh, with a number of people locally, uh, and just a few of whom are, are highlighted there at the bottom. Um, so to make sense of this subring picture, uh, here's, again, just an animation to kind of illustrate the basic idea. 
And it turns out that most of the light that we receive from a black hole is light that, that passed near the black hole. It's, it's weakly lensed by the, by the strong curvature of the space-time there um, before reaching us and, and forming this direct image. But in addition to that, there will be some photons that, that took a half turn around the black hole before escaping and, and, and reaching the distant observer. Now they have to be shot very precisely near the black hole to do that. So they pile up on a sharper feature that we call the, the N equals one photon ring. In addition to that, there will be some photons that, that executed a full turn around the black hole before escaping and reaching us. Uh, these have to be shot even more precisely. So this forms this N equals two, this very sharp N equals two photon ring. That sequence continues and the, the total image that we see is the, uh, the sum of all of these. Um, so it's the stack of all of these photon rings uh, that make the final image of a black hole. Now the extraordinary thing about these is that they're, they're almost imperceptible on images. Uh, so they're exponentially demagnified, which means that each subring has exponentially less flux in it um, by about a factor of 20 each time you, you increase the index. Uh, but despite being such a, such a faint image feature, they're completely dominant in the signal that you would see using an interferometer. And they're actually ideal to study in the native visibility domain of an interferometer. So on the left is a, a full simulated image of a black hole, again, using this three-dimensional uh, general rel relativistic magnetohydrodynamic dynamic simulation. And on the right is the, the visibility response as a function of baseline length that we would see for that simulated image. So on the short baselines, uh, it's a fairly complicated signal. It's mixing information in this direct image of the accretion disk with the sharp image in the photon ring. But once you go to longer baselines, you move to a different regime where the signal is dominated by a very simple signal, which is just a, a damped uh, periodic oscillation. And that the periodicity of that oscillation tells you the, the diameter of the photon ring along the direction of the baseline. Uh, so in this case, two examples are shown. One is for a, a horizontal baseline and one is for a vertical baseline. And this is actually a simulation of a spinning black hole viewed nearly Face on. So it turns out that the, the photon ring in the left hand uh, side of the image is not a perfect circle. Uh, but, but the degree to which it's not perfectly circular is very small. It's about a 1% asymmetry. And you can actually see that immediately on the right. You'll see the, the troughs uh, in the peaks of the red curve uh, sliding with respect to the blue ones. So even though it's this, this kind of hopelessly small effect on images, in the visibility domain, you can actually measure it very precisely, and you can read the spin right off that interferometric response. Now, it's even more exciting because uh, if you go to even longer baselines, it turns out that the sub-images decouple. These sub-rings uh, split in inter interferometric space. So on short baselines, you're dominated by the n equals 1 photon ring. Then as you go to longer baselines, you'll eventually resolve it out, and you'll be dominated by n equals 2 until you go to successfully uh, uh, longer baselines, and then you're dominated by n equals three. So it forms this sort of cascade of damped oscillations that precisely encode the properties of the photon ring uh, and where, where an instrument with a particular baseline length can lock on to just one of these and study it precisely. So what's extraordinary here is that, you know, this is unlike anything that's ever been studied in astronomy. In most cases, having a single long baseline tells you nothing about the source. You need a dense array in order to fill in all of the, the baseline coverage and produce images. But black holes are giving us a gift. They're producing this, this sharp feature of the photon ring. It's decoupling the effects of, of relativity and the strong gravitational lensing from astrophysical effects. Um, and it's allowing us to study its structure using only a single baseline, uh, uh, as long as it's sufficiently long. Um, and the other thing that's extraordinary about it is because the structure is so, uh, so sharp, the interferometric signal on long baselines is very strong. So there's actually a lot to see if we can make these baselines that extend out into space. So one thing that we're studying now is just the prospects of a space-enhanced EHT or a space-enhanced NGEHT. So again, on the left uh, is a simulated image of a black hole. Uh, the next panel is showing you what we'd be able to see if we were to observe that using the Event Horizon Telescope. 
Uh, the next panel is, is showing you what we'd be able to see if we observed it with the next generation of Enterprise and Telescope. Sharpens that, that EHT image by about 50% because of the higher observing frequencies. Um, and then if we added just a single orbiting element to the NGEHT, we'd be able to lock on to that N equals one photon ring and improve the, the, the resolution by, by an order of magnitude or more. So space baselines really give us a pathway to, to improving the resolution of EHT and NGHT images by a factor of 10 to 100. And something that's really exciting about this is that uh, right now we can only really study two black holes with horizon scale resolution. You know, again, that's Sag A star in the galactic center or M87. But if you improve the resolution of your instrument, the number of black holes that, that, uh, that come into view, the number of shadows you could resolve, uh, grows as the cube of the baseline length because it's volumetric. So if we improve our angular resolution by a factor of 10, that means that we, we would expect to increase the number of black holes that we could see by something like a factor of 1,000. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a pathway to studying not just one or two black holes in great detail, but actually doing a census of black holes uh, and, and a demographic study of them uh, 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 by, by studying thousands of black holes across cosmic history. For the ones that you, you're able to resolve the N equals one photon ring, you, you can make uh, precise measurements of their, their spin using the shape of the shadow. So we think that we could do spin measurements of dozens of black holes. Um, and then you could, of course, do tests of general relativity uh, by, by the, the most detailed studies on, uh, on just M87. Uh, so on the right is, is just a panel uh, that's from a, a recent paper uh, that's led by Dom Pesci. So this is a, a paper that looked into the, the statistics of how many black holes we think we'd be able to study uh, using different space concepts. So the EHT is shown over here. We, uh, with the, the demographic model that was used in the paper, it predicts that you'd be able to see of order one black hole using the current EHT parameters. Uh, Pushing an orbit uh, to, to say a geosynchronous orbiter or, or potentially to the moon would allow us to get into the range of, of something between a thousand and a hundred thousand new black holes uh, using this, this technique. And for each of those, you'd be able to estimate their mass to an accuracy of something like 10%. So to summarize, the EHT images of M87 have revealed the black hole shadow and, and they gave the first estimate of the black hole mass to an accuracy of about 10%. So they revealed that it's a black hole with about six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. And these images really prompted a global surge of interest in black hole astronomy, both from the public where you know, it was featured on, on many newspapers and, and um, received a lot of attention, but also through the wider black hole community. Uh, so we're getting an influx of, of new ideas uh, in black hole astronomy coming from, from people who formerly studied it just in um, you know, a pure physical context. We're now designing the next generation of Event Horizon Telescope, and we're hoping to build this over the coming decade. So this is going to directly link the black hole in M87 to its jet, and it's going to reveal their dynamical relationship. It'll tell us whether or not the, the jet in M87 is powered by the spin of the black hole, or whether it's being powered uh, through uh, gravitational energy that's being liberated through the accretion flow. The NGHT will also add enough sites that it's going to improve the dynamic range of VHT images by two to three orders of magnitude. And this will reveal a host of new signatures, uh, potentially including new relativistic signatures such as the inner shadow in M87. And this could really tell us a lot about, uh, about the space time near the black hole, particularly if we can measure both the inner shadow and the shadow in the same images. But black holes also present an extraordinary opportunity for precision tests of general relativity using uh, space scale BI. And uh, the most extraordinary thing here is because of this, uh, this, this feature, uh, the photon ring. This is a universal feature. It's seen in all black hole images once they become optically thin. And it's just produced from strong gravitational lensing near the black hole. And we think that with a, a space uh, with an orbiter that's, that's uh, something like five meters in diameter, that we'd be able to resolve the n equals one and potentially even the n equals two photon rings in M87. So we'd be able to lock onto light, that taken a, a complete turn around the black hole and probe the strong gravitational potential near the event horizon. Uh, but in addition to that, because we can measure the shadow diameter and connect that to the mass of a black hole, 
Uh, a space concept like this could potentially measure the masses of thousands of black holes extending up to redshifts of a few. So really black hole images are, are complex. Uh, we're, we're learning more about them every day, but we're also learning that, that higher resolution is a pathway to simplicity, uh, both for the interpretation of measurements, but also for creating entirely new measurement opportunities. Um, and so I just wanted to close with this sort of concept art. Uh, this was produced uh, by uh, Joseph Farah. Um, the idea of, of, of potentially expanding our current uh, very long baseline interferometry uh, to space, looking deep into a black hole and, and really seeing uh, a whole population of exciting targets to study. Um, I'll leave it with that. Uh, you know, thanks again. And I'm, I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions. Uh, Thank you very much, Michael. Excellent talk. Uh, we can field questions either by people uh, raising their hand or typing something into the chat, and I will repeat the uh, question. I'm just looking for that chat. Uh, Charles. Uh, I'm just getting organized here, but I see you have your hand raised. Oh, okay. So thank you, thank you, Michael. This is actually, ex as expected, very, very interesting. So with the smaller dishes, and I'm actually not completely clear. I may have missed it. I'm not completely clear in my head how small is small for you, in this regard. Um, so I think that depends on what you want to look at. Um, if you want to look at M87, it turns out that they can be quite small. Uh, so, so even four meter dishes when connected to say, if we included the, uh, the large millimeter telescope in, in Mexico or, or the phased ALMA array, um, because of the wider bandwidths here, um, uh, even four meter dishes are probably enough uh, to produce these, these sort of well, the high dynamic range images of M87. Um, right now we're doing a, a pretty extensive uh, sort of process of, of community outreach and, and discussing, discussing in different science working groups about different uh, science motivations for the NGHT. There's a lot of interest in, say, observing X-ray binaries with the NGHT, um, you know, observing fainter sources and so forth. Um, so for that, you really want to push down the sort of Milijansky sensitivity levels and, and larger telescopes are preferred. Um, but I would say for the, for the bread and butter science of the array, it, it certainly looks like uh, like we can do a lot of very exciting things with, with smaller dishes. Okay, but the, the baselines, you would not have small dish to small dish baselines. So it basically would be small dish to large disk baseline. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so because of in interferometry, the, the hardest thing to solve for is the, the individual station locations and, and relative velocities, uh, the so-called you know, fringe parameters. Um, it turns out that once you do that, uh, you, can, you can use those same solutions on weak baselines. Uh, so, so those are station-based solutions. So if you have a strong baseline to, to one anchor site, then that will allow you to use weaker baselines um, uh, between the, the sites that derive solutions from the anchor. Um, so it actually should be possible to, do, uh, uh, to include these, these uh, small dish to small dish baselines as well. Um, and the other aspect there is that the place where they're most desperately needed is actually on the short baselines. That's where we're, we're lacking the information about the large scale jet. So those baselines actually have a lot of flux density. Um, and so small dishes are fine. It, it's okay if we, if we have sparser coverage on the longer baselines. Um, um, so there, there are a lot of things that kind of conspire to make this an effective array design. But it's something that we're, we're of course, doing lots of simulations and trying to find the optimal balance. OK, thank you very much. Here we have in the uh, chat here. OK, we have a question from uh, Nelson Caldwell. We think all large galaxies have supermassive black holes, but not all galaxies are active in the radio, like M87. The calculation uh, about the uh, hash of such black holes visible given the addition of telescopes in space, was this lack of radio emission factored in? 
That's right. So, so the calculation there, and and I certainly you know encourage you to to look at the the paper. But um, you know, there's two elements. One is the black hole uh, mass function. Um, there are more smaller black holes, but the other is the uh, the uh, Eddington luminosity function. And and so actually, the the calculation takes into account that most black holes are actually um, uh, you know highly sub Eddington. Um, and, and so that, yeah, th that is taken into account as well as some other cuts like ensuring that the emission has to be optically thin so that you can see all the way down to the black hole um, and, and so forth. So, so we do try to model that. Um, it could certainly be done better, but, but the models do have a full uh, SED in them and, um, and, and a distribution of, of Eddington ratios that's uh, physically motivated. Okay, we have another question from uh, Igor. Chilingarian, thanks for the nice talk. Do I understand correctly that the N proportional to uh, BL cubed estimate does not take into account the black hole mass function, which increases towards lower masses? And this is the lower limit for the number of accessible black holes. Uh, sorry, sorry, I don't have a mic, so I can't ask this question. Yeah, apparently, I, I don't have a mic either, but I uh, have a backup. So uh, I, I just want to clarify that the volumetric scaling is, is just approximate. Um, the calculation that was done here to get these, say, contours and the number of black holes you would see as a function of angular resolution and flux density, this, this does take everything into account. It does a full simulation, again, of the, the black hole population and the, the Eddington ratio uh, uh, distribution, so so it is it is trying to fold all of that in. We're not we're not simplifying it zooming out the volumetric relationship. It's just that's a very good approximation for the the local universe. Okay, we have a question, Pepe Fabiano, which is actually me, Martin Elvis. Hi, uh, Hi. you're looking for uh, thirty two or sixty four gigabits per second from a distance of the moon, more or less. For the most of this interesting uh, sharp features, uh, have you? You must have looked at the communication link question because I'm, that's getting challenging. I would have thought even for optical communication. Yeah. So if you had asked me whether space VLBI is feasible ten years ago, I would have said, of course not. And there's a simple reason why, right? That the that the data downlink is is prohibitive. Um, the advent of laser communication has been extraordinary. So at this point, uh, there have already been demonstrations of 128 uh, gigabits per second from, from low Earth orbit. And there's been demonstrations of more than a gigabit per second from the moon. Um, so in order to get the kind of data rates that, that we'd really like here, uh, we, would, we would want something like, um, for our nominal mission concept that this figure is based on, we would want something like 128 gigabits per second from a geostationary orbiter. And that's actually feasible with LaserCom. Um, so it's uh, this is a, a design study that we did with uh, MIT Lincoln Lab that that Kerry Hayworth led, and uh, and it's it's a tremendously exciting area of research. I, I mean, at this point, they're they're able to downlink something close to a bit of information for every photon transmitted. Um, so, so you're getting close to just fundamental uh, data data transport limitations, and you know you. Uh, big big terminals for downlink and 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 receiving the optical, um, but but it does not seem like that's a fundamental reason why a mission like this uh, couldn't work. Um, and and again, to, I, I, this just kind of blows my mind. But you know, the Radio Astron mission had uh, something like a hundred megabits per second downlink. That, that's the most recent space VLBI mission uh, that just uh, just ended recently. So we're talking about improving that by three orders of magnitude over something like a decade. I mean, the technical technological pace is just extraordinary. Um, and I think in another 20 years, space VLBI won't even be a stretch. It'll just be inevitable. Um, but, but right now, the, the technology is just moving really fast. And, and it's not so clear where it will be in, say, five years. But, but it certainly is on track to make this feasible in the future. Uh, Gary, no, Gary, no. Gary, do you have a, can you unmute? 
Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, because you left this image uh, up here, Michael, I have a question about it. In the rightmost panel, you show the NGEHT plus space. Now, if you're looking at a black hole that is um, aligned with the ecliptic plane, uh, you will sample a range of baselines as projected uh, from that black hole. In other words, uh, at one time of year, you'll see the full 1.5 million kilometer baseline out to L2. And a quarter year later, uh, that baseline will shrink to near zero. Uh, of course, a black hole at the ecliptic pole will just see one baseline. But I think M87, uh, if I recall correctly, is not that far from the ecliptic plane. Uh, so does that image on the right take full advantage of the many different baselines you would get from uh, a dish that was out at L2, or are you just assuming a single baseline? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, thanks for the question, Gary. I, I should say, you know, Gary has worked with our group to, to, to consider uh, space VLBI extensions um, using the, the Origin Space Telescope. Uh, so that's, I think, the, the idea for, for maybe using something in L2. Um, L2 is so incredibly long that, that actually sensitivity becomes uh, rather daunting. Uh, so this particular simulation was using a geostationary orbiter. So geostationary um, uh, improves the angular resolution by about a factor of, of three and a half, but also lets you go to higher frequencies. L2 would improve the angular resolution by up to a factor of 150. Uh, so they're, they're they're quite different, um, and what you're saying is exactly right. If you take a, a single baseline, it doesn't retrieve all of this information about the photon ring. That requires that you sample your baseline over lots of different orientations. So you want an orbiter that's going around the Earth, and you you want to be combining all of that information. Um, and and this image is only possible if you do that. So if, if you did an L2 simulation, you would need at least a full year of observations to, uh, to get all that information. Uh, but of course, for a geostationary, you could do it uh, daily. Um, all right, thanks. Yeah, this is, uh, so L2, right? You're, you're, set, you're way out here in this N equals two regime where, where you're locked on to uh, general relativistic signatures and be extraordinary. But these, these visibility amplitudes out there of 10 to 100 uh, microjanskis, I mean, that's, that's a sensitivity that we can't even achieve on the ground with our enormous apertures. Um, so it's still, that's a pretty heavy lift. I think that's a sort of 2050 mission concept for VLBI, um, unless there's some, some other clever thing that one could do. Um, and and we've, been, we've been focusing more recently on, on these shorter baselines that it's sort of geo range. Thank you, Mike. Well, Michael, let me be uh, mean and ask you, see whether I can uh, uh, force you to make a choice. If you had to choose between pushing the space VLBI versus densifying the ground, in other words, looking in space for the photon ring versus uh, expanding the ground-based array to uh, study the connection at, at the base of the jet, uh, which would you favor? I, it's a tough question. Um, I, I would say both have pretty serious obstacles to overcome. Uh, so one is that these space baselines, really you want to look at a time average signal. Uh, if the black hole is dynamic and it can have lots of small scale power from, from turbulence or um, maybe small scale features in the jet, that can really mangle the signal on these long baselines. Uh, so, so I am not at all confident that if you just go out and launch this space baseline that you would, you would immediately come up with, you know, sub percent tests of GR or something like that. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, black hole movies are very hard to interpret, right? We, we have not locked on, what we would love is, um, is a clean relativistic signature of energy extraction from a black hole. So for instance, there's a prediction that, that a spinning black hole will drag magnetic fields and that they'll rotate at something like half the, the angular velocity of the horizon. 
if we had a way of pointing at NGHT movies and saying, I, you know, see, I see this dragging and this energy extraction, I think that would be as exciting as, as anything else uh, that's been shown. But, um, but you know, we're still, we're still working on that. Um, so I think both of these fronts need a lot of development to understand you know, what is it that you're absolutely sure that this, this type of mission can do um, so that you can optimize around that. Um, but, but at this point, I, I, I don't think that one or the other um, is, is more compelling. I, I think the NGHT is, is inevitable. Um, and I think uh, Space VLBI gives just a completely different look um, and, and would be a different you know, funding stream and, and development pathway. And uh, the great thing about interferometry is that uh, you know, at the end of the day, you can, you can merge it all. You can take heterogeneous arrays and use them coherently. Um, so I, I don't think that the, the parallel development is, um, is problematic. Um, so I'm trying to not answer your question. But I think both are quite exciting. Good, you threaded the needle very nicely. Uh, okay, last call for questions. I don't see any more hands raised. I don't see anything in the chat. So uh, let's take uh, this opportunity. To, oops, did somebody cough? <laughs> let's I, take this. I thought Charles's hand is up. I think he just hasn't. Uh, removed it. Do you have another question, Charles? I do have a, qu a quick question, if I oh, may. Oh, okay. Go ahead. So in this expansive vision of the future with the next generation e EHT, what fraction of ALMA time would have to be committed to EHT observations to make it um, fully effective? Uh, my goal would be that ALMA would only be needed for a very narrow range of observations uh, for a few nights a year. So it might be analogous to if you propose for the VLBA these days, you can, you can request to use the Green Bank Telescope. It's very competitive. Uh, you know, if you, if you need to do high sensitivity observations, you might get a little bit of time. Um, but I, I think it's imperative that the the core science of the NG EHT is not tied to year-round participation from ALMA. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would say the prospects there are, are looking quite good. ALMA isn't needed for baseline coverage. Uh, there are other sites that bring sufficient sensitivity. Um, and, and so there's, there's a good chance that, that the majority of the observing program could be done using just the NG EHT dishes with maybe one anchor station like the, the LMP. Um, and that's something, you know, it's something we're working very hard to understand and, and is clearly a, a major uh, decision point for, for array design. Okay, thank you. That's a, it's been a great talk. I'm afraid I do have to go, but thank you. It's been, it's been really interesting. Thanks. Michael, one final question. Uh, your cost estimate for the ground-based NG EHT, the uh, operating budget was... Uh, approaching the mythical maximum of 10% uh, per year. Is there any particular reason why you're at the high end of operating costs? Or? There are a lot of elements of this that are pretty poorly understood. So a major one is the, the um, processing the data. Uh, we, we have not converged on a single paradigm for collecting all the data in one place and then putting it through you know, the, the supercomputers to, to correlate the data. Um, so, so this number is, is, I think, quite sensitive to the amount of data that you're planning on collecting, uh, you know, to the bandwidths used, uh, you know, where you're shipping it, or, or whether you're doing some sort of real-time data transfer and so forth. Um, so I don't, I don't think that there's anything, you know, magical about this, but I also think that number is pretty uncertain um, and, and that the operations will also depend a lot on which EHT sites participate and, and what commitments are required there. Okay, with that, let's uh, thank Michael for a very stimulating uh, colloquium and we hope the money starts flowing in. Thanks everyone.